everybody. I'm Pilar Gerasimo, a founding editor of Experience Life magazine. And I'm here and so happy to be here with Alexandra Jameson, who um, I've been a fan of for many years. And I'm super excited because she has this beautiful new book out called Women, Food, and Desire. What a powerful trifecta. Um, and so thank you so much for being here with us, Alex. Appreciate My it. My pleasure. So I first got to know you in the movie Super Size Me, where I think a lot of people encountered you for the first time, where you were so charming and lovely in describing the events that had happened and in turning the whole situ around, situation around at the end, um, detoxing uh, our very toxic friend. <laughs> and I, I was really struck even back then by your presence and the quality of character that you had and your um, earnestness, you know, in wanting to contribute to the healing of this person who had managed to make himself very sick in an experiment of eating fast food intensively for a while. So since that time, you have just kind of bloomed into a thought leader and an influencer, obviously a, a beautiful author. Can you just catch us up a little bit for folks who haven't been following your trajectory? What happened in the intervening years? Well, in Super Size Me, I was the vegan chef girlfriend to Morgan's 30-day McDonald's experiment. And after the film came out, uh, we were pleasantly surprised that it was really a worldwide phenomena. We, we premiered the film in over 25 countries. We went on Oprah. We went to the Oscars. And I had the chance to write my first book, The Great American Detox Diet. And for the next 10 years, you know, I was blissfully sharing the good word about plant-based nutrition. Um, you know, Morgan and I got married. We had a little boy. And then, you know, our marriage, like so many others, started to really fall apart uh, for many reasons. And now at the age of, you know, 33, 34, I found myself a single mom with, uh, you know, a career that had been totally put on the back burner uh, to take care of my kid. Um, and I was changing, darn it. These bodies, <laughs> they just keep changing <laughs> on us. Now here I am at 35. I have a kid that I'm mostly single parenting and my energy was in the tank again. Um, my menstrual cycle was changing. My my body was falling apart. You know, this, this diet that had served me so well for so long was no longer working. Um, I was getting my period every 14, 16 days. I started craving meat. And this was not good. This was not <laughs> part of the branding marketing plan, right? Um, mm -hmm. you know, three, three vegan cookbooks in and I'm salivating over other people's steak at restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I really fought against it. I tried everything to heal my hormones and my body in the vegan framework, and it wasn't working. And I finally gave myself permission to try some animal protein secretly, of course, at home with the windows <laughs> drawn <laughs> so that no one could see. So here I was, like 10 years of beating an eating expert. And I, I was having this disordered eating all of a sudden. Yeah. But when I ate, eggs, fish, meat, I felt so much better. You know, the, the diet that sometimes heals you doesn't always sustain you. That's but right point. in this world of, you know, defining yourself and branding yourself, it's very hard to change in the view of the, the world. So yeah, once you're it, you're stuck as it. That's right. It. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that doesn't allow us to evolve. So as uh, I had to be authentic, I felt like I cannot continue um, just, I, I, start, I stopped calling myself vegan. I was just now writing, here's a plant-based recipe, but I wasn't really, it was lying by omission. And I finally came out as no longer vegan <laughs> and it was crazy. It was terrible. It was, you know, it went viral. There was online attacks. It was vicious, thousands of shares and comments. And I lost a lot of friends. I lost a lot of my newsletter list. I lost, a, it was a, it was a rough patch, but I also gained a lot of, oh, I just gained awareness. Like, you know, I need to be honest about what's true for me. And a lot of people were interested in, oh, well, I could just listen to my body and my body would tell me what I need to eat. How does that work? So this really took me on this new 
pa- this was not a, I had no plan what was going to happen after this. <laughs> But luckily, there was so much attention because there were, unfortunately, if there are a few in the vegan community that are very malicious when people start eating meat again. Um, and that got more people's attention. And, and because of all that attention, I had the opportunity to write this new book about craving. <laughs> I, really? <laughs> yeah. So I've been working with women, uh, mostly women over the last few years to really just help them tune into their body and listen to what they desire and, and experiment and be okay with that. That's incredibly powerful. I think that there's something moving that um, is sort of in the general consciousness right now that is bringing an awareness back to the um, value of desire and of wanting. And uh, I know you quote Danielle Laporte in your book, and she certainly has been a powerful force for advocating, for listening, instead of shutting out our desires and our Mm -hmm. cravings and seeing them as the enemy, accepting that there's some real wisdom in that. And you talk about this in a way that is so insightful and so powerful and so honest, I think in part because you've had such an intimate experience of having to go through and sacrifice a a lot in honor of your desire, but also because you've clearly worked with so many people, so many women um, who have been struggling to, quote unquote, overcome their desires and their cravings and really feeling victimized by their cravings and their desires. And I think the way that you describe in the book, Women, Food and Desire, the turnaround that you've accomplished in coaching women and supporting them through this process really struck uh, a chord for me. It it reflected both my very early journey in battling my own body in my 20s, but also so much of what I've heard from our readers um, with Experience Life magazine, you know, who, when we write about this stuff, have often said, oh my gosh, this is a completely different way of thinking about it. Um, have you, in the work that you're doing now, clearly you've made addressing cravings a central part of both your your work and your brand. Are you hearing or feeling anything different in the general culture that's moving us closer, particularly women, uh, toward an acceptance or a valuing of our desire? Mm-hmm. I, it's really interesting that it, in this time of lean in, you know, Sheryl Sandberg and the, the <laughs> yeah. Ariana Huffington book, you know, about... yeah. I can't remember what her book was about. I just remember Thrive. sleep. Okay. Thrive. Yeah. Sleep more. Yeah. That was the big takeaway for me. <laughs> that was the big yeah. <laughs> um, there's a, you know, there's a rise in, in women's leadership and women's consciousness about, you know, how the media is telling how media and the culture and religion are telling us we should be, doesn't always match what we want, but how do we get untangled through all that and hear what we do want? So there is a huge rise in women's leadership. You know, women are rising in the ranks in the workplace. Yet at the same time, there's this incredible piece in the New York Times recently about how there's still only 1% of directors in Hollywood are women. So it's crazy. the cultural juggernaut that is out there telling the stories of our time is still based on dudes. So, (laughs) so it's the women like you and me and the Instagram woman who's, you know, you know, healthy is the new skinny or whatever. Like, yeah, there is a growing uh, awareness that we have to define what womanhood is, what motherhood is, what success and happiness is, because it's very different Mm -hmm. from the story we're being told, but it's challenging to cut through all that stuff out there, the layers of shame, the layers of should. We have to get rid of that stuff. And what it really comes back to is listening to your body and your cravings. I really believe that your cravings are your body's language. Your body is asking you for some kind of balance. And Mm -hmm. we're really good at not listening to ourselves, toning, tuning it out, or no one ever taught us what that means, what bo- mind body connection, how does that work? So we don't know how to listen for it. All and it, our, our voice, the voice from our body is very subtle. It's like a whisper. Mm-hmm. And if we ignore it for long enough, you know, your body's like, I need, I need rest and I need play and I need to have some fun and maybe some sex and some green juice would be great. And we don't listen to it for so long. Your body's like, I need a chocolate mocha with double shot of espresso, please. 
right? Bang, 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 right. bang. <laughs> yes. So you, we only hear totally. the, the emergency call when all this yeah. time your body's been asking you, I need work that's fulfilling. I need a creative outlet. I need to yeah. not hang out with that friend anymore because she's toxic. Yeah. Yeah. So this is interesting to me. Um, you and I had chatted a while back by phone and I had shared with you that for me, the older women in my life who have gone through a big series of passages and come out much wiser on the other side have been the ones who have counseled me in the direction that you're describing. And I got the same feeling reading your book, which was listening to how you had helped women who had become so disoriented from themselves and so... um I don't know. I just felt like distance from the central part of their desire. You tell the stories of some of them who, you know, are listening. What they're hearing is, I want sugar. I want carbohydrates. I want sugar, salt, fat all at once. And I want it in the privacy of my living room with the lights off in front of the television, (laughs) eaten directly from the package. Yeah. And that underneath that, there's another series of desires that oftentimes we don't let ever see the light of day. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to just describe for our folks who haven't yet read the book, and I really encourage everyone, if you have not yet read it, go out, get a copy, get a copy for a good friend who you know is also eating ice cream in the dark or potato chips in the car on the way home, which is my favorite example. How does that turnaround usually go for people who Mm -hmm. suddenly realize, I don't even know why I'm eating what I'm eating, but I'm craving something? Um, what they realize is, uh, there's usually some uncomfortable information that your body's trying to tell you that I am not satisfied with something big in my life. You focus on sensual pleasure a lot in the book and on sensual play. And I think a really honest, courageous, cool way. So I just want to say, first of all, thank you for doing that. It's <sighs> something that women have not been very willing to do uh, on paper, particularly. We get together and have, you know, wine and talk about it sometimes. But I think that's partially because we're so hungry to acknowledge that this is a part of our life that has been mostly ignored for generations, or it's been hidden and gone into kind of a shame hole where, you know, maybe we get some craving satisfied, but it's the cost of our integrity and our sense of identity. I want to say my guess is going back 10 generations in my family, I mean, I think probably back to beyond like agriculture, I would guess very few women have ever had sensual satisfaction in their relationships with their partners, in part because there's been no discussion about it. There's been no permission to explore Mm -hmm. in it. And there's been no education on either part of either gender, really, on how to do this. So we kind of maybe figure it out for ourselves. You you mentioned masturbation, which is like nobody wants to talk about that. But it's a really important part of how I think of healthy sensuality. Talk to me a little bit about the willingness that you've had to talk about this, how it's been received, and what you want for women who are just exploring the possibility, I mean, maybe even just getting in touch for the first time with the idea that they have sensual uh, desires that haven't been satisfied or addressed. Where do we go from here? Oh, my gosh. How much time do we have? Okay. It, we have our whole lives. <laughs> well, well, let me let me say it was really hard for me to write about my own personal sexual exploration in this book. I mean, I told my family, "Here's the book. Please don't read chapter eight. <laughs> so I just, just leave it alone. I just didn't want to talk about it over the dinner table at Thanksgiving. Uh, and it's incredibly important. It doesn't get addressed, and it has been received really well. I know the the book has been listed on several lists of like books you should read during your divorce or, you know, the top, you know, top 10 books you should read to get back in touch with loving your body, that kind of thing. And I, I I consider myself, um, uh, an, a newbie, a student of human sexuality. And, and I've, for the most of my life, I've had a really positive, view of my own sexuality. You know, I was raised by hippies in Portland, Oregon. (laughs) So, so while it wasn't what I would call like a sex positive house, it was, it wasn't sex negative. It was kind of, it was kind of neutral. Like we had all the books and we had a really good sex ed program. I had it in fifth grade and I actually like had a really good education. I was a women's studies minor in college. We were given our own plastic speculum and women's studies 101. <laughs> like she said, go home and look at your body. 
And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, they should be giving, they should be doing this with 16 year old girls. Know yeah. your body. Why is such a simple, simple thing so revolutionary and so shameful? Most women have no idea that the clitoris is not just this tiny little piece. It's a huge organ with wings that goes around your, I mean, look it up. Look up what the model of the clitoris looks like. It's a big part of your body. And I'm just, you know, tiny point on the side. Can I just say it's yes. hilarious you said that because I was talking with um, Mark Hyman, who is a mutual friend of ours and who's a doctor, an MD. And we got into this conversation a uh, years ago. And uh, he said, you know, they never taught us this in medical school. None of the models that we were taught showed any of these 16 different parts that exist on this really essential part of a woman's body. It's like we just kind of skimmed over that and said, it's this little thing like this moving on. It's nuts. And when I've told women this and men this, because I discovered this again through my friend, Cindy Joseph, who's like the source of so much wisdom, I was mind blown by that. Yes. And when you say though, you know, go look it up, you have to look pretty hard to find the models that actually show yes. all of these different elements and how they can be stimulated through other parts of your body. It's like, we have to start over. We really have to ta like, I mean, toss out what we were taught about the human anatomy and just start over. It's so true. You know, this, this year was the 20th anniversary of National Masturbation Month. <laughs> so for the whole month of May, I did interviews with women sexual health experts and sex educators on my podcast because it was like, I had, A, I had no idea there was such a thing as National Masturbation Month. Why isn't everyone talking about that? And even though right. I had all this education and I've had really, I'd say pretty good sex for most of my adult life, I know so little. There's still so much to know. And yeah. talking with these experts, reading the new books that are coming out, there's so many great books. There's so many good podcasts. There's so much to learn. And again, it's just like with food, your body changes as you age and you need to know yes. yourself anew every couple of years. So yeah. you got to stay in the practice. And when yeah. I, I've written a couple of pieces on masturbation, like top 10 reasons why masturbation should be part of your health and wellness program. <laughs> Most shares of anything I've ever written. Everybody instant viral content. Yeah. Yes. I had no idea it would right. be so popular. It's so interesting that it's it, people, everybody wants to hear about it and talk about it, but everyone's a little afraid to talk about it. And that's probably like the recipe for a good viral <laughs> post in some ways. So it's like, shout your masturbation, you know, it's like right. you get a lot of good, good clicks. Well, there are a lot of people who chimed in saying, this is disgusting. This is damaging. Mm -hmm. Or I'm in a marriage. Yeah. I think it's terrible when my partner does this. And in reality, I think it can be a it can be a very healthy part of a long term relationship, um, either on your own or together. It's it's self knowing. It's knowing yeah. yourself and having time to feel good in yourself. You know, I, I feel like from such a young age, women are taught sex is dangerous. And it's never about your pleasure. It's never yeah. are we told that it's how do you want to feel, right? Sex should be good for the woman too. That never entered into the sex ed discussion. Oh my goodness. Okay. So now let's go back and make this connected dot for folks who have just been like mind blown because we've been talking about masturbation and pe probably people go deaf. I know. I mean, I think people just like, it's mm -hmm. what do they call it? Non-confronting where yeah. they're just like, I can't hear anymore. So you make the point in the book, Women, Food, and Desire, that if you have desire that's not being met sensually or sexually, inevitably the body starts going for the next best thing or the next best thing after that. It feels like women often crave food in place of sensual satisfaction, which they've either kind of written off and given up on, or they just don't think it's possible, or they've not allowed themselves to, they, they will not give themselves permission to acknowledge what they desire. Mm -hmm. And so we will go after food that creates intense pleasure, sugar, fat, salt combinations typically, yeah. but it's really hard for us to get enough of it. And so it's like we start eating at ourselves and just shoving things into our body that don't even feel that great after a while. You know, you get that kind of food hangover where it was like, okay, while well, you're eating it and then you just start to feel like yuck. Mm -hmm. And 
Interestingly, there's then this sort of secondary thing that happens that we feel fat and disgusted with ourselves. And the yeah. last thing we want to do when we're feeling like that is pursue a sensual, intimate relationship with another person or put ourselves out there or lavish physical attention on ourselves and be like feeling sexy and great in our bodies. So it kind of becomes a vicious circle. At least that's what I was taking away. And does that seem based on what you've seen, at least in your coaching experience, does that seem accurate? That's, that's exactly it. And until we can, I, here's the way out of that horrific cycle. Right. You have to believe or be willing to believe that you deserve pleasure no matter what state you are currently in or what state your life is in. That pleasure in itself is a noble pursuit and that you Mm -hmm. don't have to wait to lose the 20 pounds or be with the partner or have your marriage figured out. You don't have to wait for anything to start doing what feels good to you. In fact, Mm. I believe that if you've been stuck in this rut for years, the only way to get out of it is to start having fun and pleasure now, real fun and pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, everyone's like, when I get my ideal body, then I'm going to start doing all this stuff. Right. And Mm -hmm. they, people have this imagining that, um, you know, once they've got this awesome body, then they're going to want to take it to the gym and work out and they're going to be like great and sexy and they're going to get sexy clothes and they're going to be eating really healthy because they're going to have this awesome body they want to maintain. And my position is like, start treating your body right now the way that you would if it was your so-called ideal body Mm -hmm. because you're in it. And the more that we respect ourselves and care and think, gosh, the pleasure part is so huge and overlooked because I think that's the bridge, you know, from not having to having is like yeah. starting with that end in mind, be there now with it. Um, and, and you have a really lovely roadmap for doing that in this book. And I really respect that you took the time to share both your own experience and also the experience of your clients. What's now, na- what are you doing now? I mean, now that you've got this kind of wrapped up in a beautiful book, how are you expressing the next level of what you want to give? How are you mm. finding pleasure in your life creatively? Mm. So I, you know, I have my own podcast, which I love so much because it allows me to reach out to people who I just, I, I get off on ideas. You know, I'm like the lifelong learner. I want to talk with people about the things they're doing. It's so <laughs> fun. I could do it all day. Yeah. Um, you know, the mutual admiration society is in session. I love that kind of thing. So that's fun. Um, you know, I am working with women continually in my online programs and I help them deal with those first two root causes, the nutritional and the bacterial. Like there are, we do need to take care of these beautiful machines that we live in, but it's not just about the food. It's never just about the food. So I've, I've since, uh, in the last year I got certified in positive psychology. So I weave in, positive psychology techniques and tools for people because, you know, our, we want to be happy, but we don't want to be like, just, da, 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 da. it's not like, uh, <laughs> a, it's not like a, you know, you're on drugs kind of happy. You want to feel satisfied and fulfilled, right? Yeah. <laughs> and positive psychology is really focusing on your strengths. You know, what's mm-hmm. already good about you? What's naturally yeah. a skill that you have focusing on that is really a mindset shift. Like, Oh, I don't have to fix myself. I'm actually, I I have this that I don't appreciate. I'm good at. So how can you focus more of a spotlight on that? And I love talking about food and sex and psychology. You know, uh, it's just, it's fun to talk about. It's hard to talk about. And it's the stuff that if we don't talk about it, change isn't really going to happen. Um, yeah. we need to yeah. be teaching both young men and young women at an earlier age that their bodies are not shameful, um, that there are ways to enjoy and take care of themselves and to communicate better with each other and with their own bodies. Uh, that's how we end the war on the sexes is by opening up yes. communication. You know, I'm a full on feminist and I love men and we cannot reach a state where there's equality and where sex becomes uh, safe for all of us. If, if they're not included in this revolution. Oh, and, that's well said. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yes, all of that underlined, <laughs> all of that. <laughs> 
Well, in some ways, I feel like you're taking on, you know, it's like the next bastion. I think for so long, um, you know, I've been in the health and fitness um, journalism space for the past almost 15 years now. And a lot of the reason I got into it was my frustration with all of the things that weren't being talked about, that, you know, everything was just diets and workouts and diets and workouts and you know, half the content in most of the of the health and fitness magazines I was reading was either wrong or insulted my intelligence or was just completely irrelevant to me or didn't work. And um, it struck me, you know, when I launched Experience Life, it was with a commitment to addressing whole person, whole life, health and fitness, and really including these elements that have been under discussed and under acknowledged around psychology, relationships, connections, our environment, the media, the things that influence on a daily basis, the cultural norms that we're, you know, beset by that work absolutely against us. And, and I think it's like we're entering a time now where we are having to clean up some of the messes of the past several decades, the, the, the inequalities, the waste the toxicity, the, just the yeah. overwhelm. And it's like, I think that there are real careers to be made. And I think you are doing a beautiful job of demonstrating how that can work. Coming out and being honest about just speaking the truth about what we've observed and experienced and putting a spotlight on the teachers and the wisdom, the bodies of wisdom that can help us grow from where we are. I think life can get so much better from here. And I love that you write with such a hopeful voice. It's not an angry, you know, things aren't wrong and we've been treated bad. Badly. It's like, hey, listen, there's a whole beautiful repository of potential available to you in your life for more pleasure, more satisfaction, more beauty, more discovery. And all you need to do to start is do- just become more aware of what you actually want. Like, quit judging yourself for your cravings and your desires. And so I... Mm. um I'm really excited to have our readership connect with you. You know, our audience often, I feel like so many people come into this world through one gateway, which is like, I want to lose weight. Mm -hmm. I want to look better. Mm -hmm. And I want to feel better. And once they get in the door and start unpacking what lives, you know, underneath all of that, there's so much more of a payoff. And it is in purpose and meaning and happiness and satisfaction and connection and equality and all of that. Well, there there is one piece that I think doesn't get any examination and that's relating to to food and to sex and to body image, which is uh, going back to this idea that sex feels scary. The the male gaze, um, that getting attention for your body after you haven't gotten it for a while, or if you've never had it before, you know, I hear this from my my clients all the time, they're like, I started losing weight and I started getting attention and it scared me. So I started putting the weight back on because sex is scary. Yeah, And we have to acknowledge that and and unpack it a bit and unwire it because when, when sex becomes safe, when we feel good about our sexuality and confident in ourselves, that's when we can really change our relationship with our body and food. Oh, that is fantastic. Okay. So I could talk to you for like five days and I want to keep talking and I hope we talk again. Um, And people will be finding out more about you everywhere, but where can they go today to find out more about you, your book, your podcast, and all the cool Mm, stuff you're doing? Perfect. So alexandrajameson.com. That's my home. And just so Jameson is J A M I E S O N, Mm -hmm. just so folks get that right. Mm -hmm. Or quick link Cravecast Pod. That's the Cravecast is my podcast that will take you to the history of all the podcasts on my blog. Nice. That's great. And f- people can find you on social media. I've enjoyed watching your posts come through on Instagram and, oh, I mean, pretty much everywhere. You're just about everywhere, I think, right? Instagram <laughs> is my favorite. <laughs> Instagram is my favorite. Delicious Alex. That's where you can hang out with me. Delicious, Alex. What a perfect handle. I love it. I want to really thank you again for taking time to talk with us, talk with me and the book, Thank you for writing the book. It's going to change a lot, a lot of lives. And we're looking forward to having you in our um, up, an upcoming issue of Experience Life, where we're going to be talking about instincts and desires and really look forward to your contributions there. And hopefully we'll just get to do more over time together. I think we need to have so like a girls weekend coming. somewhere, personally. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, totally. Yeah, out, And out of that will come the next great program. Let's change the world, man. It's great. It's good now and it's only going to get better. Let's put our attention on what we want to see grow and change and um 
Yeah. So keep up the awesome work and we'll talk more soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alex.